Buckle in tight, guys. This is gonna be a long review. Hi, everyone. This is Shaj, and I'm back with a fresh review. It's been a minute. I'm sorry. I'm planning a wedding. A lot going on right now. And today, we're gonna talk about The Curse. The Curse is the recently concluded Showtime series about a newlywed couple trying to turn their eco-conscious housing ideas into a reality TV show on HGTV called Flipanthropy. Their marriage is tested by an oily, opportunistic producer that wants to take the show in a different direction, and by a curse casted onto the husband, Asher, by a little girl. This review will contain spoilers, so if you just want to see my score and hear my final thoughts, jump to this point in the video. There you go. There is a lot to unpack with this show, so I'm going to concisely explain as much of it as I can in little time as possible, so I'm, I'm probably going to miss something. Just bear with me, okay? okay? To say this show has been divisive is a bit of an understatement. It's the type of show that you're either really going to vibe with or just viscerally hate. I had no idea what to expect. It features Nathan Fielder, Benny Sapp, both of whom I love, and Emma Stone, who has been just delivering great performance after great performance recently with this show and also Poor Things, which she will probably get an Oscar for. All three of them produced it. There's 10 episodes, and this is <laughs> a very weird off-putting, excruciatingly awkward satire about performative philanthropy and a struggling marriage that takes some... <sighs> really strange turns towards the end. The show is pretty ambitious and tackles a lot of different things like gentrification, white saviorism, trendy environmentalism, and mysticism. The curse is like if you took The Office and somehow made it like 10 times darker and just made it even more cringe than it already is. The name for the show comes from the inciting incident where Asher, played by Nathan Fielder, gives a $100 bill to a young girl selling sodas in a parking lot is a good deed, but as soon as they get the shot, he snatches the $100 bill back, saying that's all the money he had, and offers to give her $20 instead, prompting the young girl to curse him. This scene is what really gets to the heart of what drives this show. You have these characters who feel this pressure to do good things, especially when the cameras are around, but they don't know how to actually be good people. The biggest issue people seem to have with the show, beyond the fact that it's uncomfortable, is that nothing happens or the plot doesn't develop efficiently. I wasn't necessarily bothered that the show didn't have a conventional TV story structure, but it did do this thing sometimes where it would set up these interesting subplots only to get distracted by other things and either not come back to them until way later and deliver a payoff that felt shortchanged or just not deliver a payoff at all. I felt this way about that subplot involving the guy that buys one of their passive houses and removes the induction stove. They don't really come back to that, kind of a subplot that they just sweep under the rug, it seems. There's a lot of build-up to what Asher does at the casino, and I feel like the fallout or the consequences from it don't really match all the build-up that we got for it. But what the show lacks in terms of a focused story, I think is made up for with its unrelenting sense of dread about what will happen next. The show has an impressive ability to make you feel multiple things at once and blend multiple genres together effortlessly, like drama, comedy, thriller, and horror. It's that ability to do so much is what makes this show so interesting and so dynamic to watch. The line between these dramas feels so thin at times that it makes it impossible to predict where the show is going to go next. The drama switching shouldn't be a surprise though when you consider that Nathan Fielder, who is no stranger to genre-bending cringe comedy like The Rehearsal, directed seven of the ten episodes. The role he plays is only different for him in the sense that it's a mostly serious performance and not comedic, but this role is a very familiar territory for him because it requires that same cringe energy that he's delivered so many times in the past on shows like Nathan For You. What makes the show even more stressful is the fact that it is very much a Safdie Brothers production with the cinema verite style, lots of scenes being shot on telephoto lenses to make things feel claustrophobic, while also creating the sense of distance from the main characters in a 
voyeuristic type of way. I love the grimy look and feel of this show. According to Ben Safdie, they intentionally shot it in HD and scaled it up to 4K to achieve this look. The droning score created by John Medeski and Daniel Lopidin sounds like a, a distant relative to the scores of Good Time and Uncut Gems with how it ensconces you into various stressful and emotionally haunting feelings that really adds weight to what we're seeing. This Safdie Brothers type of dirty and unrefined approach juxtaposes beautifully with the scenes we see directly from the reality TV show, perfectly representing visually how the main characters want to see themselves and how imperfect and gross and disgusting everything around them actually is. The cherry on top of the cake is how well I think the commentary and symbolism is interwoven into the show. The curse could have very easily just settled for the whole, oh, reality TV is so fake and so are white rich liberals and how the facade disappears once the cameras aren't rolling. The show takes a very subtle approach and makes a deeper point about how we are pressured into presenting a facade to people all the time, especially with social media having such a strong presence in our lives. In an era of media where there's a little bit of a tendency to just go after white privilege and white saviorism in a really basic way that we've seen so many times, it's so refreshing that the show is able to do that and also go after the people who are way too far in the other direction, feeling this intense guilt of white privilege to the point that they start doing really stupid things to fix problems that don't get to the core of the issue. This is best explored through the character Whitney. As a fun fact, the name Whitney actually means White Island, <laughs> a very appropriate meaning for this character who makes a lot of questionable decisions. The whole reason why Whitney is able to get into showbiz and real estate in the first place is because of her parents, who are affluent slumlords. Whitney has main character syndrome and is determined to separate herself from her parents and be benevolent to everyone and be the Green Queen, which they later changed the name of the show to. I love how they explore the angle of her using ecological sainthood as more of a cynical marketing tool to sell homes than an actual attempt to fix the environment and meet the needs of the people. There is a point at which you have to ask yourself, is this, say, $100 uh, sustainably made shirt by a local artist actually worth $100 because the materials are that much better and the process is that much better? Or is this just a marketing strategy to make something feel more premium than it actually is and you're trying to fucking rip me off? Whitney doesn't understand that being nice and uh, putting a green label on everything and throwing money at problems won't fix everything. This is very clear when we watch her deal with theft at the boutique denim store that she runs by telling the cashier to charge all the stolen items onto her credit card. She does this because she doesn't want the bad press of being a, a rich, white, privileged person going after presumably poor minorities stealing clothes. But she also probably doesn't want the crime in the area to scare off people from buying her super expensive passive homes. Word spreads quickly that the store doesn't stop theft and now more people start showing up and uh, stealing things. Congratulations, Congratulations, you've made the problem worse. Whitney takes the same transactional approach with a local indigenous artist named Kara. She spends a lot of time trying to convince Kara to be part of the show in some way, whether it's having her art appear in it or have her act as a native consultant. It's painfully obvious through all of their interactions that she's just trying to prop Kara up to shield herself from criticisms of gentrification and make herself seem like this ally of the local indigenous people of Española. Kara knows this and visibly resents Whitney and her proposition, but she'll still do it so long as the price is right and she's not directly mentioned in the show. There are so many scenes between these two characters that are just so cringeworthy and just so painful. And I loved every second of it. The subplot with these two characters sets up one of the more satisfying payoffs when Kara reveals during an interview with Whitney that her weird art expo where she gives people a slice of turkey meat and then screams is meant to symbolize her selling a piece of herself. I thought it was really cool that her performance art actually meant something and wasn't just stupid nonsense. I thought that's what it was at first and I thought the show was making fun of Whitney for assuming that it was like really deep when 
she had no idea what it was or what it meant. I love the scenes when Kara's native friend just says a bunch of like stupid made up philosophical native gibberish and Whitney always responds by saying, that's so beautiful. With Whitney being in an unhappy relationship that she paints differently in the show, she's visibly affected by hearing what Kara has to say because she's doing the same thing. She's selling her authenticity away for the sake of making money. This scene is one of many where Emma Stone says so much non-verbally in her performance. Like you can understand a lot about how she feels by just looking at her facial expressions and her body language. Another character that's interesting is Asher. I think the stakes are a lot higher for him than they are for Whitney because maybe outside of Whitney, there's no one we know of who really cares about this character, a fact that he seems to be aware of. Whitney has all the power in this relationship as she cares about it the least. Because of this, he does a lot of things to make himself seem worthy to his wife, which often goes wrong like in the first episode when he gets aggressive with a reporter who pries about Whitney and her parents' sordid past and real estate, or like when he confesses to his former co-worker Bill from the the casino about being the whistleblower who leaked the story about the casino preying on its guests and tries to act weirdly masculine in front of Whitney while doing this. We get one of the most amazingly cringe lines from this scene after Bill calls Asher a tool and Asher responds by saying, actually I am a tool because tools fix things. I was honestly really confused as to why they were even a couple in the first place as Whitney looks uncomfortable and annoyed with him most of the time. It doesn't help that Asher also has a micro penis, something that the show lets us know in a close up in the very first episode. The whole scene where Whitney's father, who also has a micro penis, tries to encourage Asher by equating micro penises to. <laughs> The tasty small cherry tomatoes was so fucking weird, bro. It was somehow more awkward and painful than the sex scene Whitney and Asher have in that same episode. They throw a lot of shit at you in the first episode. It was very funny, but also made me just squirm like a mother dude. I think the reason why Whitney liked Asher enough to marry him is because Asher is probably one of the few people who are willing to go along with and reinforce Whitney's flawed ideas and perception of herself. She's the type of person who can't handle having a partner that treats her as an equal and calls her out on her bullshit. This bites Whitney in the ass later on though, as Asher's infatuation reaches a point that's just downright creepy. She recognizes that he's more in love with the idea of who he thinks Whitney is as opposed to who she actually is. In episode nine, Whitney is too scared to tell Asher to his face that she doesn't want to be with him so she has Dougie play a deleted scene from the show where she basically embarrasses him and talks about how she's not satisfied and wants to break up with him in front of the entire crew. You would think that this would end their relationship, but it disturbingly makes Asher even more committed. He brings up how he thinks he's been cursed this whole time, but he realizes that he was the problem. He is the curse and he's gonna change and make things right. This scene feels pretty terrifying with how Asher is smiling and telling Whitney everything is gonna be okay and you see her tearing up and kind of looking at Asher in horror, but also sadness as she knows that nothing is gonna stop him from wanting to be with her. He even promises Whitney if she didn't want to be with him in the future and he truly felt that, that he would disappear forever without her even asking. And this segues perfectly into the final episode, which has caused a lot of debate and analysis about what it means. Episode 10 takes place in the somewhat distant future when Whitney is visibly pregnant, approaching her due date. The relationship with her and Asher seems to be in a better place than it was before, but you still get the sense that something's off after that weird scene when Asher and Whitney are featured on Rachel Ray. He gives the house he planned on flipping to Abshir, saying that what makes Whitney happy is making other people happy. Clearly, Asher has still not learned his lesson and is desperate to win Whitney's affection through more phony deeds of altruism. He and Whitney go to Abshir's house and record the conversation, expecting some kind of big reaction from Abshir, which they don't get. He 
understandably asks about property taxes and the paperwork involved. During all of this, there's a strange man who's walking in the background whose beard is covering his mouth and looks eerily similar to the guy who helps install an AC unit in the baby room at Asher and Whitney's house. We then get an unsettling scene of Asher showing affection to Whitney's pregnant belly, saying there's a little me inside of you, and watch her look kind of uncomfortable and then smile at Asher as though she may know something that he doesn't. The next morning, Asher is stuck on the ceiling, and Whitney tries to get him down as she goes into labor. They think it's because of the pressure in the passive house, that's why he's floating, but we quickly find out that gravity has in fact been reversed for Asher, and he gets stuck in a tree as the doula tries to pull him to the ground. This episode is really jarring because of how different and absurd it is in comparison to the episodes before it, and how it's not as grounded in reality. You see what I did there? There's no way to know for certain what this ending means, but there are a few ideas that I think could explain it. I super recommend watching a video by Daniel Barrero, whose explanation for what all of this means I pretty much agree with. You can find that video in the description below. I think that Asher was indeed cursed, and possibly cursed himself when he told Whitney he would disappear when she didn't want him around anymore. The birth of his child is definitely connected in some way, since he's floating, you know, into the sky at the same time the baby is born. So I think that he and his relationship to Whitney has no weight or meaning anymore in Whitney's life now that she has a new purpose with this child. A lot of the imagery during the sequence mirrors the imagery of a childbirth. Cutting the branch that Asher is hanging onto could symbolize the cutting of an umbilical cord. As a fun fact, apparently chainsaws were created not to cut down trees, but to cut through the pelvises of women who had a hard time delivering, so there's that. Asher is pulled by the doula and floats into the sky in a fetal position, which looks pretty similar to how a baby would look fresh out of the womb. So I think the show is hinting at a sort of rebirth of Asher, a rebirth that allows him and Whitney to escape this relationship and allow Whitney to have a genuine connection with someone. I think that Asher's death could serve as a sort of relief for him, since he's never really felt like he's belonged anywhere. So maybe he's reincarnated into the body of his child to have a healthier relationship with Whitney? I I think something along those lines is likely the meaning of the ending, but that's not to say there aren't any other possibilities or meanings that could go along with this ending. I think the part where Asher says it's the pressure from the house that's causing him to float might be hinting at the show physically pulling them apart from one another. I think Dougie cursing Asher after he makes that comment about his dead wife might have something to do with it. I like how they neatly wrapped up Dougie's arc by having him finally take responsibility for not looking out for Asher, something he didn't presumably do with his ex-wife who died from Dougie drinking and driving. I don't think it's a coincidence that the shot of Dougie crying in the street with the ambulance in the background looks similar to how the scene of a drunk driving accident might have looked. I also don't think it's a coincidence that this happens right after Asher gives the house to Abshir and records his reaction without Abshir knowing. Maybe this was like the final straw and the universe decided in this moment it was time for karma to punish Asher. I kind of thought that the story would conclude with Whitney or Asher or Dougie doing something horrible that would expose themselves and ruin their public image and shut down the show. Which in hindsight seems really naive since the curse from beginning to end thrived on being unpredictable. While I'm still scratching my head, not certain as to what it all means, I appreciate the show taking a big risk with this ending and not settling for a simpler climax, even if it might have been vastly different from everything else. Outside of some of the cheap looking CGI effects of Asher floating towards the final moments, everything looked really good from a technical standpoint and the whole sequence is just really intense. Is this a hard show to recommend? Yes. It's dark, cynical, and engineered to make you squirm. But at least it has something to say and has a unique artistic vision that perfectly suits the story it's trying to tell. I'm a big fan of both Nathan Fielder and the Safdie brothers, so I'm biased, but I guarantee you that when you watch this, you will at least feel something. Even if what you're feeling is dread or anxiety or stress, don't you want to watch something that's going to actually elicit genuine emotions from you instead of the vast ocean of lifeless content out there like f 
fucking MILF Manor. While the curse hasn't gotten a ton of attention during its run, I'm pretty confident that this is the type of show that could and probably will become a cult classic with time just because of how weird and out there it is. You can watch this on Paramount+. Plus. I'm going to give the curse a 9 out of 10. Thanks for watching this review, guys. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you thought about The Curse in the comment section below. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you really hate it? Did you give up after the first episode? If you like what you see, hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications so you can know when I drop the next review. Thanks again, everyone. I will see you later. Stay warm. And yeah, until then, just, you know, just enjoy yourself. Watch a good show. Have some, you know, uh, almond milk or something. I don't know. Just, I'll see you later. Okay, bye.